So let's stand up on our feet. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. This is the last message in the series of the urge, the vision and mission of Generations Church. And if you will, read aloud, loudly with me, these two verses, we're going to read Proverbs 29, 18, and we're going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12, okay? Here we go, one, two, three, read. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now this verse, the word revelation in the New King James, in the Old King James, it's the word vision, and it just means that you see the future, you have a vision for your life. And it says the people cast off restraint. Where there's no vision in the King James, it says the people perish. And that word perish there is literally translated correctly here, cast off restraint. They are like people that have no control over their lives. And I don't know about you, I've seen a few people in my life that don't have a vision for their life and they are out of control. They're making mistakes right and left and doing things they shouldn't be doing. And, you know, that's what a vision does. It guards you, it motivates you, and it keeps you under control. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you know that every, according to these verses, every one of you are in the ministry? Amen. Come on. Look at the person on your right and left and say, you're in the ministry. You know, typically we've looked at the ministry as being someone that is on stage. I don't believe that. I love, and I'll give another announcement commercial. At Monday at lunch from 1145 to 1245, we have watermark right here around some tables. We had 10 or 11 men, I can't remember which, this week, and we've been studying a book about how you're in the ministry when you're on the job. And you need to come be with us, men. It's been a really lively discussion. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive, it's quick, it's sharp, it's more powerful than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray that your anointing will help me to communicate your word with clarity and authority that is not mine. It's yours. And Father, I will be careful to give you all the glory and the honor and praise today as we talk about what happens when a vision comes under attack. What do we do? How do we respond? What goes on? And Father, I just believe that people are going to leave this place today knowing that they've encountered Jesus in a powerful way. And if you believe that with me, say amen. amen. You can be seated today. In this last series, last message, I want to talk to you about what you do when your vision, your dream, your destiny, the thing that you feel is your purpose comes under attack. It could be in your business, it could be in your marriage, it could be in your family, and notice I made a distinction there because sometimes you have issues in extended family situations, not just your marriage and the, your immediate family. In your church, you could have, the, anytime you have a vision, it comes under conflict, it comes under attack. And just as a quick review, we've used this acrostic to talk about vision. Urgency is the U in urge. R stands for resources. G stands for greatness and energy. I hope as you have felt like I have that God is giving you urgency, knowing that he's going to provide all the resources we need as a church or you need as a businessman, and that he is going to, your desire to be great is not something that God looks down at. God just, he's not concerned about you desiring to have greatness. He wants you to be great. He wants you to be excellent. He just wants you to get there the right way, and that's through being a servant leader. And then energy is that you have divine energy. Romans 8, 11 is a great verse for having divine energy. And I've been defining vision for you. I've got three different definitions we've been using every week. You probably should be getting these down and memorizing them. George Barna says that a vision is a mental image of a preferable future. What a great quote. And uh, I love that one. And then... Uh, Pastor Tim Timberlake, this is the newest one that I've been meditating on, wrote this. He said, a vision is a deep dissatisfaction with what is, com what is combined with a clear grasp of what could be. I don't know about if you've ever found yourself, I, I, I think probably every one of us have been there. And that's how you define vision, that you want to do something about what you're dissatisfied with. 
And then the third one is one I wrote many, 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 many years ago. And it is this, the overriding plan and purpose of God for your life that unfolds and progresses. I think when I wrote this was back in the mid-1990s and it was in a season in my life where my vision was unfolding and progressing. It wasn't staying the same. There was something new. There was something fresh that I was realizing God wanted me to accomplish. And, uh, you know, folks, vision is not static. And it's not just in one spot. It is constantly moving. Uh, Because when you're static, you're stagnant. And God wants you to be able to be moving and be available to do that. And, of course, I've shared with you, let's say it together, the vision of Generations Church. Everybody say it with me. Touch the city. Teach the nation and train the world. In some form or fashion, we're doing all of those tonight at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. We will fill this parking lot with people for trunk or treat. Back there on the back table is your sign-up sheet where you signed up, and I think most of you got that signed up got a phone call. Before you leave today, would you go back there on that back table and just check off that you're going to be there and doing what, you're, what you volunteered to do, and that will help us greatly. So today, I want to finish kind of where we started. We started talking about the vision that Nehemiah had back in Nehemiah chapter 1 and chapter 2 about how he was uh, in the Babylonian captivity. He was serving an evil king. And he was the cupbearer. And somebody had come from Jerusalem to where he was and given this terrible report about the condition of Jerusalem. Well, he got a vision to go back and rebuild those walls. And he went in to see the king at risk. He was depressed. He was downcast. He was frustrated. And the king noticed and said, what's the matter, boy? And he could have lost his life, literally. But the king recognized what was going on. And he said, this is what, he said, I've got a burden for my, my people back in Jerusalem. The cities are, the gates are burned, the, the walls are broken, and I want to go back. And he had the gumption, that's not a word we use all the time, he had the courage to look at this king and say, would you give me everything I need? And would you send an army to protect me? And would you tell all of the people that have the materials, the wood, and all the building materials I need, will you write me a letter and tell them to supply those things to me? And you know what? The king did it. Amen. And the king asked, though, how long is it going to take you? And this is where we find that God gave Nehemiah a very, very specific vision. Well, this morning, if you'll look up on the screen, we're going to read where Nehemiah's vision for what he was doing came under extreme attack. He says in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 19, he says, Then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people. Now, these were the people that were already living there, not the people that had traveled with him. The work is very spread out. And we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, and then God will fight for us. We worked early and late, from sunrise to sunset. And half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. Verse 23, during this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me ever took off our clothes. And even though they were smelling. (laughs) We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went to get water. What what, What is this telling you? This is a clear picture of a man who's not willing to leave the work, a man who's leading a group of people, and he's knowing, he's telling them, he's teaching them, he's training them. The vision that we're accomplishing is important, and it's under attack. And he's saying, be on guard. Be ready at all times. If you hear the trumpet sound, come help us. Come on, Deborah, how, how, how long have you been sounding the trumpet? She's in church. God's healing her. Pam, how long did you sound the trumpet? Seven months. 
See, we got, we got to rally around people when their vision for their health or their family or their life. We, as the body of Christ, we've got to hear the trumpet call and rally around those people that are under attack. Pray for Kimmy Hayes. She's up in the hospital and they're just not sure. We prayed for her this morning. But keep praying for Kimmy and keep believing for them. But there is some, there's four specific things. And you see on the back of your bulletin, you can take notes with me. All of those uh, Bible references that are in red are in the book of Nehemiah. So verse 23 that you see on the screen is the last verse of Nehemiah chapter 4. So we're going to pick up the story in Nehemiah chapter 5. And the first thing that happens is division. Oh my. (laughs) Did you know that when it comes to vision, division, attack, usually comes within, not from without. Comes from within your company, within your family. Within your church. What? What? You mean you're, you're called to the ministry? I was talking to someone just this week that they had sensed a, a divine call to the ministry. It, it's, it's, a, another, it's a youth pastor in this city that I'm mentoring right now. He called me up from another church and said, uh, my family knows you and they've heard about you. And my, my dad suggested that you, I call you and get you to mentor me. And I said one question. I said, well, how come your senior pastor doesn't want to mentor you? He said, I went and asked. And my senior pastor just said, that just laughed at me. That was his response. He laughed in his face. He didn't have time, I guess. I don't know. But how many of you know attack usually comes from those closest to you? It does. And it's not that it's, you, you don't like X them out of your life and say, oh, you're evil. I don't ever want to talk to you again. But you got to know who called you. you got to know who gave you that vision. Who put that on the inside of you? And then no doubt, this, you know, just like this story, the attack of the vision didn't, wasn't coming from within. It was from Sanballat and Tobiah, the Horonite. It's from other tribes. It, it was from other people outside the city. At one point in Nehemiah chapter 4, they were harassing Nehemiah and all of his team. And they were attacking their work and said, listen, your work is so lousy that even if a fox walked on those walls, it would crumble. Literally, you can go read that. I didn't pick it out to read that, but I was rereading that, and it was just, there was just a total discrediting of their workmanship, their work ethic. And you know, sometimes attack will come from without as well as within. Amen? Are you with me? Let's read some scripture out of Nehemiah chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Chapter 5 and verse 1. There was a great outcry of the people. And their wives against their Jewish brethren. So this is attack from within. This is their Jewish brethren. For there was those who said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. So they're asking for food. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. So here's what they did. They went... And they put up their house, they put up their land, they put up their vineyard, they put up their house, their all their house, and said, Listen, this is collateral. I need food. Are you are you tracking with me? It's right there in the scripture. Verse 4. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money from the king's tax and our lands and vineyards. So the tax they were paying on their land, they were borrowing money against their land. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of all our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, to buy them back, for their other men have our lands and vineyards. You know what they're saying here? We have mortgaged our entire life just to live. And we've mortgaged it to our brethren that are charging us this interest. We not, not only can we not pay the payment, we can't pay the interest. We're stuck. I don't want to raise your hand or get you to raise your hand or stand up or anything, but, but some of us have been there. 
You know, it's true when Solomon said the borrow is servant to the, the story's inter, it, It's bearing that fact out. Look with me at verse 6. Here's Nehemiah's response. I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Wow. He's got a group of people under him that have come from another land. They came from a a, a place of prosperity, even though they were uh, detainees or they were, uh, you know, refugees in another land. And they they came back to Jerusalem. And and here, the people that are living in Jerusalem, the officials, they have put them under this heavy burden. So there is division within the ranks. Here they are under attack from the outside world, but they're also getting attacked from the inside. Amen? Amen. Here's the second thing that happens when we get to that spot. We, we confront it. Listen, what you don't confront, let me just say this to you. It's hard. I've had to learn this the hard way. What, if you keep it hidden, it'll never get healed. In other words, if you don't confront it, if you've got some hidden drama in your life that, oh, I'm ashamed, I don't want to let anybody know this, I'm going through this, and I'm going through that, and if it's financial, if it's emotional, if it's an addiction, and you keep it hidden, it's never going to get healed. You've got to confront what's going on. You've got to confront the division. You've got to confront the problem. Because you know what? If you don't confront it, what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. Man, it's quiet in here. Maybe I need to preach to the online audience a minute. <laughs> Confrontation's never easy, friends. I don't want to get all fired up and yell at you and scream at you and preach at you. I just, I just, I've been through it. It's not fun. I don't like it. Man, if you like confrontation, I, You need counseling. (laughs) It's just not fun. It's not easy. I've been the confronted. I've done the confronting. It's, It's just hard. But it's necessary. It really, really, really is necessary. Look at the text. Look at what he did. This is Nehemiah chapter 5. Picking up. Let's see. Hit the same scripture. Verse 6. This is picking up in verse 6. We've already read verse 6, but we're going to pick up there. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, okay, how many of you have heard the phrase, think before you speak? He did it. After thinking it over. I don't know about y'all, but I've opened my mouth and inserted my foot more times than I care. Okay. He thought it over. I spoke, and then, he, and then he says this, I spoke out against the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting. Man, he's going to put them on blast. He is putting their business in the street right now. At the meeting, I said to them, this is verse 8, we are doing well. We are, we are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners. They've had to sell themselves. We're, we're doing everything to buy back. But you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What, are you, what you're doing is not Right. Do you know that in this day and age, it, there's no, I mean, we, we want to live in the gray. 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 Why? Because there's no conflict in the gray. Because the gray is easy. But when you declare what's right and what's wrong, you're either on one side or the other side. And the one that's, the, the, we'll just call it the black side against the right side, the white side. And I'm not talking about race here. I'm talking about right and wrong. And when you decide and you declare your allegiance to Jesus and you get on one side or the other, there are going to be people that disagree with you. You just have to know if you're, if you're on the side of truth, if you're voting on the side of truth, if you're voting on the side of biblical issues, you know if you're against abortion, you're for the Bible. 
Come on, somebody. And you just got to be wise. But quit living in the gray. Because it's easy. Make a decision. Choose this day who you will serve. I pray for our young people all the time because living in the gray for them is so easy in their high school or their middle school. They don't get any flack. But you take one of our students that declares, you take a high school student that declares they're they're for God. There's going to be people, even teachers, that will attack them. My suggestion for all of you young people and even for some of you adults, if you want to stand on the side of right, but you want to keep your mouth shut, just carry your Bible to school and put it on top of your desk in every class. You don't have to preach. You don't have to say anything. This book will do all the talking you need to have. Put it in your backpack. When you get to English class, the first thing you take out of your backpack is your Bible right there. And if they tell you you can't, we got a lawsuit coming on. We got some, your pastor will go help you. Because you've got the right to carry this book. It's called freedom of speech. I got fired up. I got to calm down. <laughs> Verse 9. Then I pressed further. What you're doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? In other words, what Nehemiah is saying to these people, that their own people, not the nobles, not the officials, not those people, to their own people, what he's saying to them is they're mocking us. We've got these divisions. We, we're fighting with ourselves, and they're over there pointing at us, laughing at us, and mocking us because we can't get along with each other. Nonsense. You know, don't ever argue with another believer over things that are non-essential. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? We're, we're, man, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We still believe that God's healing today. Those are non-essential things to salvation. If they don't want to, to pray in the Spirit, if they don't want, if they don't want to believe, if, if God's offering them five $100 bills and they only want to take three, that's their problem. <laughs> I'm taking all five. I don't know about y'all. I want all he's got. Amen? Amen? But I'm not going to argue with somebody. I'm not going to isolate my brother or my sister because they don't believe what I believe about non-essentials. So there's no sense. Stop arguing about that stuff. Don't know why I'm saying that, but I'm gonna t- I do know why I'm saying that. Because arguing over non-essentials brings division. It's one of the reasons we're divided. Johnny Mack was telling me a story last Sunday about how they got to go lead worship at a Baptist church where they got, to, got saved and first got... Well, they've since made some changes in how God has ministered into their life. And, and, and the guy told, Johnny Mac said, said to the guy he was leading worship like he does up here with us, all energetic and fired up. And the, and the guy asked, Johnny asked him, said, do you want me to be kind of calm and, you know, not? And he goes, no, that's why I invited you. <laughs> now, they didn't say anything to Jeannie. They were scared of her. Come on, we don't want to bring division, right? We want to bring Jesus to people. So we know that there is in this, there's division, there's confrontation. And then thirdly, there's got to be a resolution. You know, I want to teach this. I've taught it before here at church, but I just want to teach it to you again. I didn't put it in my notes, but I'm regretting that I didn't put it there. 
Let me do a short, brief little insert into my message and teach you how to be good at confrontation because it is necessary, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your family, or whether it's in your business, or whether it's in your church. Tears, timing, and trust. I don't mean you got to be crying. What I mean is your attitude has got to be, if you're going to confront somebody, your attitude has got to be that your heart is broken that you're having to do this. You've got to have the proper attitude. I know that I've had to confront my kids and on situations or my wife or something, and I can just remember times, you know, that I'm just pacing the floor. And I'm just, man, when she gets home, I'm just, man, both barrels. I'm just going to unload. How many, how many of you know that didn't work out well? Because my attitude was terrible. But when it breaks your heart that you're having to make this confrontation, your attitude, tears, timing. You'd never want to embarrass anybody. Man, I, you know, being a grandfather now, it just, it sometimes, I, when I, and I know it's necessary, sometimes when my children or my, or my daughter-in-law or my son-in-law or they get on my grandkids, it's like I'm, I'm cringing. I'm like, I want to intervene. I want to say, don't. But I know it's necessary. But, but. Sometimes it is necessary to do it in public. But most of the time, man, when you've got to confront somebody, like I said it last week when I was talking about honor manners. You honor publicly, you influence privately. You always do the confrontation in private. Tears, timing, right timing. Think about the timing of your confrontation. I can say this, and I can say it. I can't say 100%, but I can probably say 98% of the time when I had to discipline my children, it was in the bedroom, the door was closed, their siblings and their mother was not anywhere near. It was just between me and the child. And it was so that they wouldn't be embarrassed. The punishment, whatever the punishment was, whether it was SWATs, we did believe in corporal punishment and uh, still do, by the way, not did. Uh, but it works, it works. Some of them, the pain, the remembrance of that pain, it, it makes a difference in their life. So the last T, tears, timing, and trust. You know, the person that you have to confront, they've got to know that they 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 know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them. Confrontation does not work. If, if, you're just, if you're in the wrong spirit, if you're in the wrong time, and that person doesn't, knows you don't care about them, and I'm talking to some of you business people. You, they may not be your family. They may not be your kin. They may not be in your church. But they, man, you've got to care about your employees. And when you care about somebody, you communicate that to them. And when you have to confront them, they know you're doing it because you care. Amen? All right. So resolution. How do you get a resolution? Well, let's look at what Nehemiah did here. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse <clears throat> um, 11. He just lays it out to them. You must restore their fields. You must restore their vineyards. You must restore their olive groves. You must restore their homes. And to them this very day and repay the interest. He tell, he's telling them to give them back the interest. This is astounding, folks. <laughs> give them back the interest you charged, and when you lent them the money, give them back the grain, the new wine, the olive oil. And look at this. Look at what happened. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. Man, the Spirit of God had to be in this thing. <laughs> right? We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. Evidently, the government leaders had promised to do the same thing or something similar. There was a resolution. Here's the thing, folks. When our vision, when the mental image of our preferable future, when we are dissatisfied with what is, combined with the knowledge of what could be and we start moving we met we get we meditate and we get a revelation from God and then we implement our vision and we start acting on what God's called us to be do not be shocked when it comes under attack but confront the attacker if it's the devil 
If you know it's a satanic attack on your life, you've got the word of God, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the power of the agreement of the brothers and sisters in Christ to stand with you and push back the devil. And he has no choice but to obey and honor that. So there can be resolution. You know, there, yes, there are impossible situations. Yes, when Johnny and Pam heard of the, the doctor, the medical uh, uh, diagnosis of cancer, those, for some people, that's an impossible diagnosis. For them, it was, God's just going to take over. Amen. For Roy, for Joe. For some of you, you've had the impossible situation and you've you and, and it divided you, you stood in faith and it divided your family. They said, Well, 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 what do you mean you're gonna stand in faith? We don't get that. Well, just hide and watch and you'll see. God's faithful. And you have the confrontation, and then you have the resolution. God comes through for you. And sometimes it's not that simple. I mean, how many of you know this story wasn't that simple? They had to give back money and lands and houses. And, you know, in our world, it'd be cars and, and boats and all the things that you mortgage. They had to give it all back. Here's the last thing, number four. You realize the vision. It happens. It comes true. And you know, I I just want to pause for a moment and be real with you. Sometimes you're stuck in the process. Sometimes between the division or the conflict, the confrontation and the resolution and the realization, there's long periods of time. How many of you know, know Moses waited 40 years? Joseph saw a vision, waited 13 years, and part of that time he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, went to prison for it. But all of that, God used all of those things. Sometimes it's a process. Next Sunday we celebrate 16 years of of Generations Church being alive. We're not what we used to be, but we're not what we're going to be either. We're still realizing the vision is still unfolding and progressing. But the realization... I mean, we, we're in the process. We're servant to a lender right now. But we're in the process of owning building and property. And There was a day and a time in, in, in the life of Generation Church, we didn't think that was ever going to be possible. It took, the, it took a banker that didn't tell us that he had sold the building out from under us and to give us 60 days to get out. An impossible situation that God came through in a big way. There's a few of you in here that remember those 60 days. I went from flat out, straight up anger at the banker to I want to lay hands on you three ways, hard, fast, and continuously. (laughs) To, oh God, you got to help us. Because we had a congregation to move in 60 days to do it. He came through. We realized it, and we're still realizing it. Look with me at the text in Nehemiah chapter 6. This is so cool. It's in your outline. So on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Wow, isn't that cool? The Bible gives us a date. Why did he give us a date? Look what the next line says. Just 52 days after we had begun. 52 days. So you, you gotta go, you gotta track all the way back to Nehemiah chapter two when the king said, How long is it gonna take you? Fifty-two days after we had begun, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, see here's the attack he's talking about, they were frightened and humiliated. How were they? They were frightened because God was on the scene. They were humiliated because God came through. When they had told Nehemiah, there's no way you're going to finish this. If a fox got on your wall, it's going to crumble. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. 
Somebody say amen. amen. During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. These are the enemies. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Aaron. There's all these weird names that I can't say. Verse 19, they kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds, and then they told him everything I said, and Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Man, I'm telling you what, right now, man, the Spirit of God's in this room right now, and those words right there, there is somebody in this room, somebody online listening to me, the enemy is trying to intimidate you and to get you to stop and get you to freeze up on the inside and stop believing God for your vision, for your children, for your marriage, for your church, for your business to prosper and grow. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of intimidation off of your life. And I tell you that your God is big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to come through for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Refuse to be intimidated today. Chapter 7, verse 19 is the end of chapter 6. And I want to read the first verse of chapter 7 with you. After the wall was finished and I had set up the doors and the gates and the gatekeepers and singers... And Levites were all appointed. They got back to the work of the ministry. Sometimes you have to stop ministry and fight for one another. Sometimes you have to stop doing what you're doing long enough to rally around one another and fight for each other. When you hear the trumpet sound, rally to that sound. Stop what you're doing over here and go rally to that sound and help them win their battle. And then when you get back over here and get back to work, you might be the one that blows the trumpet that needs the, to rally around you. But the bottom line is refuse to be intimidated. In my takeaway today, I want, to, want you to see it the way I wrote it. I was just writing in my journal one day and wrote these words. Discouragement will come at the time when you are progressing. When you're moving forward, discouragement will come. Therefore, focus on the vision, keep climbing, because the devil only fights what God is doing. The devil only fights what God is doing. Nehemiah was doing the work of the Lord, what God gave him a vision to do. He was doing the work of God. That's the only reason he came under attack. You know, if you're listening to me today and you've just tried to start getting your life together, see, that's why it's easy to become a Christ follower, but it's a little bit more challenging to live for God because you put a bullseye on your forehead for the devil to attack you. The devil will probably never get you to turn your back on Jesus once you give your life to Jesus because you feel that sense of relief. You feel that sense of peace. You love what God does in your life. But what happens, he, the devil tries to get you to stop. To quit. To go back on what he's called you to do. So, I want to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. And I want to just pray with you. I want you to bow your head. And I want you to close your eyes. And be in a spirit of prayer. Just for the next few minutes. And I just, I'm, I'm just believing God today for a breakthrough. The Lord's given me two things specifically that I need to pray for you today. As you've listened to this message, if you've sensed the attack of intimidation and discouragement on your life, that's one thing. So be thinking, if that's you, you know who you are. And the second person I need to be praying for today is the person that's under attack through division. There's, there's, you're being attacked within. There's division in your family, in your business. You feel it attacking you, a divisiveness. Father, I just thank you that as I've sensed the Holy Spirit in this place today, Lord, people, people are being touched. Seeing these things in the scripture, in the life of Nehemiah, has brought to life how powerful you are. God, you enabled Nehemiah to overcome every attack of the enemy and finish and realize the dream. God, I'm thanking you that we can do that. If you're standing here with me today, you resonate. You're, you're saying, Pastor, that's me, division. 
I'm being attacked, dividing. It's trying to get me to back up. I'm discouraged. I'm intimidated. I'm going to count to three, and I want you just to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. If that's you. If you've got your hand up, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith today. I haven't done this in a long time. But we, I want us to sing this song over you. And I'm going to ask you in boldness and in faith, not to embarrass you, but to take a step of faith if you raised your hand. Nobody's going to come put a mic in your face or ask you to express what you're here for. But if you raised your hand, even if you didn't, I want you just to come stand at the front right here. And we're going to sing this song over you. And just come on, just come on, be bold. Just come on, step out. You raised your hand, come on. I saw four or five of you raise your hand. Come on, just come on right up here, right now. Just get right up here. We're going to sing this song over you. And you can just spread out and worship with us, but let this song, let victory just come into your soul in whatever area, in whatever way. Come on. Come on, church. Let's sing and worship like this was you at the front. Sing over these people. Sing by faith over these people today. Oh, I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I. You broke my chains, freed my soul yes. For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved
be unto God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God. If God be for you, who can be against you? Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you for a powerful day at church today. That, Lord, we're leaving here filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with victory for the kingdom of God. That if that same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It'll resurrect your dreams. It'll help you. It'll strengthen you. Every head bowed and every eye closed in this room today. And online, if you're with us today, and if you need Jesus as your Savior, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, maybe you have never said yes to the loving, saving, forgiving power of Jesus Christ, today's your day. Maybe you've strayed from the path. Today's your day to come on back home. You get a do-over in Jesus' name. Lord, we're just praying. Pray with me, church. Maybe there's just one person. I just want to tell you right now, if you're watching online or you're in this room, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you make right, you are made right with God, and by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Confess that you're a sinner with me this morning. Believe that Jesus was died, buried, and resurrected, and raised to the right hand of the Father. Let's pray this prayer out loud. Everybody in the room and everybody online, pray it with me right now. In the name of Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me that much. I know I am a sinner. I confess it. I need Jesus. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I've been in charge too long. I need you to take over. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer sincerely and you meant it and you're in the room, I want you to just lift your hand. If you're online, I want you to hit the link that they've provided for you and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. And what I want to do, I want to do, if you're in the building today and you've just lifted your hand, or if you're online, we'll mail it to you. If you're in the building, I want to meet you right over here, my left, your right, and I want to give you this little book called Now What? And I want to help you live for Jesus today. Amen. And let's give the Lord a hand clap for what he's done today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.